You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here with episode number 170 of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, before I introduce our guest for today's show, I want to mention some very important items regarding this podcast. Now, I found the privilege of interviewing hundreds of some of the most talented guests over the last four plus years that I've been hosting this, this podcast, the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, which is something that I'm truly grateful for. And you're probably wondering why I'm actually telling you this. Well, I've conducted many interviews that have simply never been released before. For. And it's not because they weren't absolutely awesome or jam-packed with incredible value, but more so, they accidentally fell through the cracks and never made it on our release schedule. Today's show was one of them, and it's absolutely awesome, and it would pain me for you guys not to hear it and take away a ton of value, just like I did when I conducted the interview. And so I've decided that throughout the coming months, I'm going to start releasing these oldie but still very goody episodes one by one for your listening pleasure. I'll be sure to inform you at the beginning of the show if the episode you're listening to is one of the older recordings and if there's any relevant updates that you need to be aware of. Now, for about 99.9% of the shows, the information is still completely relevant and applicable today, okay? I won't release it if I think that it isn't applicable to your business today or it doesn't add you some value. For example, in today's show, we discuss uh, an investment opportunity that our guest was offering and while that specific investment opportunity is no longer open, he has since opened subsequent offerings in which you can partake taken should you have an interest, okay? Now, just to be clear, I'll also still be bringing you new episodes along the way, but there will be weeks where there's one of these older recordings mixed in. And so with that being said, our guests for this week's show are Daryl Heller and Dave Zook. Our show with Daryl and Dave is going to be somewhat unconventional because we're going to be talking about a very unique investment vehicle that I'm guessing not many of you have ever even thought of investing in or even knew that there were investment opportunities available. And that investment vehicle is ATM machines. Yeah, that's right, guys. ATM machines, or as some of you older folks might remember, uh, them being called Mac machines or money access centers. Uh, this is way back in the day, but we know them today as ATM machines. The beautiful part of this niche is the attractive returns and the aggressive depreciation attributes associated with it. And so today we're going to be speaking with two leading experts associated with this niche with the very end goal of providing you with enough information to see if this unique niche uh, has the cash flow and has the, the attributes that you're looking for uh, to fit into your investment portfolio. So I'm very excited to go on to the show with Daryl and Dave, but before we do, I have a few important items to quickly run through with you guys. First off, as you guys are all aware, I specialize in mobile home parks. That is our business, okay? Not ATM machines, although we are considering that investment niche, uh, at least me personally, I am. But as a company, we specialize in mobile home parks, and I tell you this because we are seeking mobile home parks to purchase, okay? We're open to joint venture arrangements or paying out big fat finder's fees for the right deals. And so if you run across a mobile home park opportunity as you're out there searching for other types of investments, and as long as it's 60 plus spaces in size, we'd love to talk to you about it. So whether you're looking for a team to either help you take the deal down or maybe you're just looking to flip it and make a big fat profit from a finder's fee, then please think of me. Uh, you can email me directly, kevin at kevinbupp.com, and I'd love to chat with you about it. Uh, we can handle deals or portfolios of deals as, as large as $25 million, okay? So there's really no limit. Uh, I will tell you that just the minimum size that we're really seeking is about 60 lots or larger. Now, we actually uh, currently have two deals that we're working on that were brought to us by listeners just like you um, very recently that will end up paying close to $200,000 in referral fees on, okay? How would you like to pocket a big fat check or multiple checks just like that for bringing a DR away, okay? Pretty attractive, right? Well, I'd love to work with you, so please think of us. If you're out there on the hunt, you run across what seems to be a good opportunity in the mobile home park space. Next up, I want to provide an update regarding our mobile home park fund. If you're a regular listener, then you know that we just recently closed out our very first successful regular 
D 506 C uh, fund. And we couldn't be happier with both the parks that we purchased as well as the many investors that we've had the pleasure of partnering with. Unfortunately, with the good, there was also some bad. And what I mean by that is that there were a number of you who had shown an interest in working with us or partnering with us on that first fund, but weren't able to get in prior to us shutting the doors. Well, I've got some great news. Uh, me and my executive team, uh, we're currently working very diligently on rolling out fund number two, okay? Mobile home park fund number two, and expect to have it ready to roll uh, by Q2, so quarter two this year, 2018, so it just in the coming months. So if you missed on that very first fund and you have an interest in partnering with us on this mobile home park fund number two, please be sure to go to our website, Sunrise Capital Investors, and create a free account inside our investment portal, okay? This will, this will do a couple things. Number one, it will place you on the first to know list for when mobile home park fund number two actually rolls out and is available. Um, and based on the, the demand for that very first fund, we expect to fulfill our subscription very quickly. So you definitely want to be on the first to know basis. In addition, there's also a link there where you can schedule a time to jump on the phone with, with our team, me and my team, to answer any questions that you might have about this future investment opportunity, okay? So definitely go to our website, sign up for the free account. It's, it's, it's just our secure investment portal. You can create a free account and you can actually schedule a time to talk with me and my team about this future investment opportunity that's gonna be rolling out here just in a couple of months, okay? So definitely wanna get on that list if you have any interest in working with us. Uh, lastly, guys, if you happen to be in the Tampa Bay area, I'd love to meet with you, so please shoot me an email, kevin at kevinbup.com. If you have some free time while you're in town visiting, I'd love to meet with you. Just had dinner the other evening um, with a gentleman that was out of town from uh, from Texas. He was in, uh, in, in visiting a relative and uh, had the opportunity to have dinner on Sunday evening. It was awesome. A lot of fun. Uh, we got to speak shop, uh, mobile home parks specifically because he owns mobile home parks. Um, we got to speak about mobile home parks and his investment uh, and uh, you know his goals and objectives and um, just had a lot of fun with it. So we had dinner for an hour and a half or two and I loved to do that with you. So if you're in town, please look me up, Kevin at KevinBup.com. Now, guys, let's get on to the partnership that you've been waiting for, which is our interview with Daryl and Dave. So here we go. So Daryl and Dave, thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the show. So first off, give us a sense of geography, where you guys are based out of. I know we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording the show, but um, give our listeners a little sense of where you're from, because our listeners know where I'm from, but you guys are from a very similar area. Where's that? We're both from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. There we go. Amish country, right? <laughs> it is. <laughs> I, I, think, I think, Dave, I think I told you the story uh, when we talked before about, um, you know, we used to drive, living in Harrisburg, we'd drive to the Maryland shore. That's where we would go for our vacations yeah. and driving through Lancaster and uh, driving through all the horse poop on the roads. That, 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 was, the, oh, that yeah. was the memory I have of being a, a young, young child of driving through that or, avo I guess, avoiding it <laughs> or getting stuck in traffic jams <laughs> behind horse and buggies. So, uh, anyway. All right. Well, uh, you know, it's 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 kind of interesting how uh, how this interview actually originated uh, because I was interviewing you, Dave, a month or so ago regarding your multifamily investments in real estate development business, and somehow we got talking about ATM investments, which, by the way, I, I never ever gave any considerations to. I mean, I know that they exist, and I know that obviously someone owns them, someone makes money from them, but I just never really gave them two thoughts. And so, you know, I'm always seeking you know, higher alternative investments that offer, you know, more diversica diversification and yield my portfolio. And, and so I wanted to learn more. I started asking you more and more questions. And finally, you're like, I got to know it. You probably got to know with me. You're like, come on, Kevin, like, let's just get Daryl on the show. You got to talk to my buddy. He knows more about this niche. He's the expert. And so Daryl, you're here with us now. You're the man. You, you are the, you're the ATM. Well, I'm gonna call you the ATM God here for the day. Okay. And uh, <laughs> you're gracious. I don't think I'm worthy of that, but thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to be on your show. Yeah. Kevin. Really excited to have both of you guys here. And so what I like to do before we really dive into this very unique niche is just take a few minutes and each one of you, if you would, uh, just give our listeners a little bit more of a background about yourselves. And maybe, Daryl, you can start first. Yeah. So unlike the ATM God that you um, coined as, <laughs> I actually am a telecom and technology entrepreneur. So I started my first telecom company when I was in college and drove that to a financial event subsequently down the road. And when you look at my portfolio, um, it's been, you know, buying, selling, founding technology telecom companies. And you can say, well, why ATM? Because, you know, ATM, most people would not necessarily see it as a core telecom or technology play. However, it does have derivative contexts to both, and therein lies the reason I'm in it. So, 
that's my background. I got introduced to this space and made my first investment in February of 2011. And, you know, I conducted significant due diligence on the space at that point and got comfortable with the operating returns, learned that a lot of the investment in this space was through, you know, private equity and, and hedge funds. And, you know, here we are. Uh, whatever it is, you know, seven years later type thing in the space or six plus years later. Okay, fantastic. How about yourself, Dave? Yeah, so I, I've been an investor for most of my adult life. I mean, since I was in my late teens and I've invested in several different asset classes, but just, you know, especially in the last decade, I've just really narrowed down to say three or four teams that I do a lot of business with. And, and one of those, uh, you know, we talked, Kevin, uh, about a month ago about our multifamily portfolio and and it was in 2012 uh, that one of my dear friends uh, and advisors Bill Poole and and uh, introduced me to Daryl and his partner Jerry and so I did a deal with them we uh, I invested in the multi uh, yeah I did a deal with them I invested in the ATM space and ever since I mean I'm talking you know every month just uh you know the cash flow just keeps pouring in and and it has become my most passive investments and it's just uh one of my favorite investments and not only from a strong cash flow perspective but also from a from a tax uh standpoint it it gives you plenty of um, tax shelter uh so i got involved in this space and a couple months ago daryl uh, approached me and said, "Hey, you got a you got a network of investors. Why don't you uh, why don't you take a two million dollar tranche of this of this investment and roll it out to your investors?" And so I did, and and we sort of kind of blew right through that, and uh, we're ready for another round. So it's been a great experience, been a great experience from the investment side, and now also from uh, the sort of uh, syndicator where I roll that out to my investors, my a lot of multifamily investors and have given them access to a different asset class that's been a whole lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it sounds very interesting. In fact, that's why we're that's why we're here right now because I'm interested in it as well, and I know our listeners uh, will be as well once we get through at the show. Um, so, give me an idea, just a general uh, perspective of how many ATM machines or how many you know I, I don't know how you how you quantify this, but um, how many machines you guys have currently under ownership management? Maybe it's a dollar amount, maybe it's an actual number of physical machines, but um, give us an idea of, to the extent of the current investments you guys are involved in. What does that mean as far as ATM machines are concerned? Yeah, now I'll take that on from a Prestige level. We have four funds inside of Prestige. Fund D is the one that Dave and I are partnered on and that we're representing today. All the funds are similar in nature, but we started with Fund A and closed that and then Fund B, C. Fund C is just a big private equity um, entity owns that and controls that one. And now we're in Fund D. So, you know, when you roll all that up, uh, we're approaching around 4,000 ATMs. You know, our investment is, you know, approaching the 55, 60 million range. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. And so let's start from an elementary point of view and let's first talk about, I mean, well, why ATM machines? I think you guys kind of answered that already. I mean, it's all about diversification. You like the asset class, they produce incredible cash flows, but what let's talk about where the profits are actually made. I mean, is it, is it strictly from a, uh, from a service charge standpoint? Uh, you know, are there other areas as well of profit centers? Yeah. So I'll take that. The, and we're just kind of back to the why question and then I'll get into the specificity sure. on how you make money. But the, the why question, when you, when you tie this, I know there's a lot of real estate, I'm assuming investors on this podcast and mm-hmm. certainly yourself, Kevin and Dave as well. And in addition to, to my place, so I kind of saw this as a quad, quasi real estate play and that you go control a small uh, lease within, you know, could be travel plazas on tool pikes, could be malls, could be in bodegas in New York City, which are very popular. But the places you would see ATMs were taking out a, a seven year lease there. So it's it's got this real estate context to it and then it has a hard asset behind it. So in terms of how you make money, I can just break it down for you real quick. For those that have used ATMs, there's a surcharge typically that can range anywhere from, you know, it's been as low as, I guess, 99 cents certain places, but generally in the 2 to $3 range to, you know, pull cash out. That surcharge um, is essentially broken down through various uh, people within the food chain. First of all, the owner of the ATM or the investor, in, in this case, would be each one of you. 
um, would contract or we at the prestige fund level contract with a management company to, to operate that ATM. So they are the ones that contract with Armored. They're the ones that, you know, have the big lines of credit to bring the cash out. They're the ones that contract with maintenance companies to, to maintain the ATM. But back to the surcharge and how we make money. So, for example, let's just take a 250 uh, typical surcharge. Approximately 25% of that, when you get into the model, goes to the investor. Uh, say 35 to 40% of that um, to the location owner. It could be the, the mall management group could be in, in Pennsylvania, term pay case, it's the Pennsylvania term pay commission. You know, if it's a group of retail um, stores, it's obviously the owner of that. And then the remaining 35 or 40% is retained by the management company to operate, insure, and, and maintain the ATM. Hmm. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. And, uh, you had me- mentioned something about <clears throat> the management aspect of it, how you guys manage. You you, you typically outsource with uh, w- with outside third party management groups that kind of handle the replenishment of cash, that handle the even the potentially the placement of machines, probably the maintenance of the machine. Is that typically the case, or is there a component that's actually vertically integrated into your business? No, that's it's very common. So when you get inside this space and study it. Uh, first, most people think the financial institutions own most of the ATMs, but when you're going to look at our ATMs or ATMs that individuals on this call could own in the future, we will often brand with Citibank or other large banks. So our ATMs may look like a, ba- a- like a bank ATM. However, it's really an ATM owned by huh. you know, an individual. And in terms of you know the, the outsourcing, banks themselves will, will outsource it. They don't put their own, they put their own cash in it. They use their own cash, but you know, they hired armor brinks to go do it. You know, the maintenance of the ATM, if there's a paper jam, if something goes wrong, that's obviously contract on the outside, the insuring of the ATM, et cetera. So the kind of the, the summary of that, Kevin, would be we as the investor and the fund own the ATM. So we control our destiny there. We then contract and there's a few reputable management companies across the country you know, one is, you know, one or two are public companies. There are other, there's a few others that have significant scale. I do, just for disclosure purposes, have equity in a management company that we use with regularity that we've had a lot of success with. So they basically, we outsource the, the entire management to them. So when it comes to putting in cash, maintaining it, insuring it, you know, all the things that come relative to the operation, they do it. The the transaction of that event, so for example, if you're going to pull out $500 from an ATM, you know, there's a processor behind it. And when you look at the processors that are being used, it's the same ones that, you know, are doing all the bank processing for mm. your local bank. It's Fiserv, it's Elon, et cetera. So it's, you know, it's a regulated system and ultimately, It contracts with a processor to do all the processing with the financial institutions, and then that surcharge is paid through to the management company, and a percentage of that is paid through to us, and we own the asset, and that's essentially how the financial model works. Okay, fantastic. So you're not sending Dave around with a sack of money to replenish these machines. That's not happening. (laughs) No, he couldn't get, he would struggle to get there quickly in his buggy. Yeah, that's funny. (laughs) So, so one of the, one of the things that really piqued my interest when Dave and I had a brief discussion about this were the tax advantages, more so the depreciation schedule. So can you speak a little bit to that, Daryl? Yeah, so one of the advantage of this when you get into the return side is it is a, you know, it's a hard asset. You're paying a little over $15,000 for an ATM. So these ATMs look a lot different than the one you see in your street corner that may be a little plastic one. It's the more robust financial institution looking ones. And that ATM is fully depreciable. So at this fund level, we're, um, we're depreciating it over five years. So it's got a straight five-year depreciation. There's a little variance in it. But when you look at the first five years and you look at the associated income that comes from surcharges, probably about 70%, perhaps a little more of your income that comes in for those first five years is shielded as a result of the depreciation. So they depreciate out over five years. There's some exceptions to do 179s, but as many of you probably know, a fund has to designate how to equitably treat its LLC members Mm because each individual is a member of it. So we can't do bonus for one, 179 for another, and, you know, straight five years. So most funds like this always choose straight five year to the extent that we get into the end of the year. Sometimes there's creative things that we can do to place 
it and another fund to drive a 179 event, but that's a, you know, a little more of a complicated transaction and not something we can commit to, but certainly the five-year depreciation plays itself out and a vast majority of your income is shielded um, and you get to hold on to that cash instead of paying it through to our, you know, our friendly government partner. Yep. yep. My Uncle Sam. Good and old Kevin, Uncle Sam. And Kevin, and Kevin when, when, just to make sure that your listeners understand, when, when Daryl says shielded, He's talking. About, we're talking tax-free income. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're talking seventy between seventy and eighty percent of of your income coming off the machine in that first five years is tax-free. Yeah, that's incredible. No, no, I I, I get it. I mean, that that's one of those big things. As we have our had our three or four minute conversation, Dave, was that I was like, man, that that's in, that sounds absolutely beautiful. I mean, I like it. That's why again, that's why you guys are on the show right now. I want to learn more about this. <laughs> so, and, and, and the other and the other thing, uh, the other thing for your listeners, I want to make sure we're clear. You know, we're talking percentages. You know, the management company gets a couple. You know, gets their percentage. The sure the store owner gets their percentage, but really. When when it all comes down to it, when somebody walks up to that machine and swipes their card and does that transaction, you as an investor get 64 cents out of that transaction. And that's really where the revenue comes from on the investor side. You get 64 cents out of every transaction that happens at that machine. Hmm. Interesting. So how do you guys choose your locations? I mean, give me give me an idea of the, um, the due diligence or the uh, location selection process that goes into finding these. I mean, obviously, the more traffic, the better, right? I mean, you, you don't want a machine sitting in the middle of, I don't know, um, in the middle of a farm in Lancaster, right, where no one's going to use it. So give me an idea. And I know you guys might, you guys aren't necessarily involved in this component of the business, but uh, Daryl, I know that you, you mentioned you've done extensive due diligence on the business model itself. So you probably have a, a real strong um understanding of location selection and such. Yeah, I do. And I, and we do collaborate on, on, you know, location selection. And there's a, it's a great question because there's a lot of, you know, precision that goes into it. As you noted, certain ATMs just don't meet the performance expectation to pay through this higher return. So uh, you will, we're really looking into areas like I mentioned, you know, travel plazas when you go across the country you know, Warren, Pennsylvania, Turnpike, Mass Pike, all through Connecticut, all through New York. We have a lot here in the Northeast. But when you go into a travel plaza with a food court, you know, that would be a great place. Malls, Class A malls, we're in tons of malls. You know, an area that is highly attractive, which may be surprising until you kind of get your head around um, what I'm going to say, and that is Tier 1 cities, uh, you know, all throughout the five boroughs of New York. We have you know, hundreds and hundreds of ATMs there, and there's like 14,000 in the city, and they're some of the most high-performing because when you look at who's banking on these, um, what plays into it at some level is ethnicity. So you got that, you have the underserved from a credit perspective, and Mm -hmm. when you do transactions, some years back, our government um, moved to a debit card for EBT, so our welfare system Ah, functions on a debit card, and therefore this really becomes the bank. Um, so essentially, a lot wow. of those individuals may not even have the credit to have a credit card. So that's why tier one cities from Chicago to New York, I mean, we're really starting to penetrate many of them. Even um, we have a swath coming in from Washington, D.C. right now, interestingly enough. But Houston, you know, Miami, all throughout, because that EBT usage is so high. And these ATMs on like a traditional ATM that may do 100, 200, these do you know, four or five, 600, sometimes in a mall food court area could do, you know, a thousand or a couple thousand. So I'm going to use that if you don't mind, Kevin, just to bring some clarity to um, the kind of how we handle that 64 cents. So just by virtue of what I stated, I'm sure a lot of you are already saying, wow, um, you know, who is going to be the ATM God that chooses me to get the New York City, you know, <laughs> bodega that performs way better than, you know, a class B mall that's in a, you know, threshold type city. And we had a lot of um, interesting discussions on that way back when, because initially we would just swath some money come in and the management company would arbitrarily place it. It was random. And some investors were making a lot more than others. Everyone, every investor was making pretty good return, but some of them really good return. It was just by virtue of they ended up getting, you know, some ATMs and food courts. And if you go into your local mall, I can ensure you that the ATM in the food court likely is three to four times the transaction of an ATM that resides within the mall or even at the end 
entrance point of the mall. So mm. there's great variance. And what we did some years back, based on the request of our investors, is we created pooled funds. So we'll take similar demographics and we'll take hundreds and hundreds of ATMs and pull them together. So we'll do a bunch of travel plazas, a bunch of malls, a bunch of bodegas, maybe a bunch of small retail convenience stores, et cetera, which again, which by the way is another great target. Um, we'll, we'll take all those locations and blend them together. And we go back and look at the two or three year history of those ATMs. We understand demographically where they reside. We understand the impact um, on the future side of whether they're going to stay neutral, grow a little, or, or compress a little. And then we force the management company, um, and the management company is part of this process, to give us essentially a fixed return so that investor A is not making three or four more percent than investor B because, mm-hmm. again, just by virtue of the draw, that can happen. So they blend, can be 500, can be 700, depending on how the big the funds are and the portfolio um, is. Right now, this is portfolio M, so it's going to be over 1,000 ATMs. It'll be blended together. And they look back over the history, and they can project the future very well. What may surprise many is there's a slight uptick to ATM usage, some driven by the aforementioned things I mentioned earlier, others by things that, such as banks, are increasingly seeing this as a vault on the street, and all banks are struggling to get individuals into their branches. Their branch counts are down. You hear it from every regional, even national bank, and you go into New York City right now, you'll see Bank of America, Chase, and otherwise with these kiosks that are interactive that ultimately is a you know is, is an ATM that's transacting. So there, there's a lot of movement in this space that we think it's going to stay secure for a period of time. Every investment has risk, and, and you know we can't guarantee anything into the future. But when you look at the trends over the last four or five years, the actual our transaction count um, is actually slightly uptick, and when you blend all our ATMs mm. together, which is a, a real positive. So that may be a little more than you were asking, but I wanted to get into kind of how we cr- provide equitable treatment. And the 64 cents is real how they calc it, but it's pulling in a lot of ATMs. They look at it and they say, you know, as a result of this portfolio, we can pay, you know, $2,155 for every 104000 invested. And that, you know, some ATMs where you're going to be assigned to ATMs to depreciate them and you own them, you're going to get paid not just from your ATMs, but the pool of all of them. So your ATMs sure. could actually be performing slightly below that or slightly above it. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Now, is there, uh, you answered a ton of questions there actually that I had lined up to ask you. So thank you for the, uh, for the detail. Um, is there opportunity, I mean, are, the opportunity that you guys are seeing as this space grows or, you know, over the next couple of years, are you seeing that it's the growth opportunity is in available empty space that currently does not have an ATM in place? Or are you guys actually doing, uh, are, you, are you in acquisition mode where you're buying ATMs that are already existing that you're buying up the current lease or remaining lease time. Um, I mean, give me an idea what that business, that part of the business model looks like. If, if I ask that right, do you understand the question there? Yeah, I think I do. Okay. I'll, I'll answer it to, and you can tell me if I'm going down the wrong road. Almost 100%, you know, 98, 99% of the ATMs that we're placing are into existing locations. So we're on seating a competitor um, or it could be a merchant-owned environment where the, the retail you know, store of 20 or 30 had their own ATMs in there and we're trying to manage it. So we're, we're always putting our ATMs in a place where there was ATMs so that we know the historical data. If not, there'd be much more significant risk. Gotcha. So, you know, there is surprises. You'd expect, you know, a travel plaza here in XYZ part of the world to be consistent with another part of the world. And that's not always the case. There's nuances to them. So it's very important to us. And part of our requirements and prerequisite is we will only go into locations and you will only go into locations that had existing ATMs. So we basically pull out the old ATM and put our new ATM in. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. And I was looking on your presentation uh, just very briefly. I noticed that there's actually some ancillary um, uh, revenue stream opportunities, not not just the actual surcharge that gets made from from the transaction. But I see that some of the ATMs, some of the newer age ATMs, have advertising space on them, and um, it seemed like there was a couple other ancillary opportunities as well for revenue streams. Can you speak to those a little bit? Yes, yeah, certainly. So, you know, many I'm sure have already said, "Well, this seems like a mentor space," and you're kind of processing through the things that we've been chatting about and I had the same, you know, assessment. I'm a technologist, so this is certainly not a sexy investment. However, when you study um, my portfolio, I'm part of a a private equity company that does a lot of investment in these type of spaces and otherwise. And we, we have often gone after mature 
spaces that have a next generation revenue opportunity or monetization opportunity. So having said that, Kevin, that's where ATMs are something that I'm very bullish about and excited about, given we think there's a next generation revenue stream and we're already starting to experience this at certain levels. Mm -hmm. So. I'll give you a highlight because it's a, certainly a much deeper conversation. And if you if you review our, you know, our PPM or our offering memorandum, you'll get a little more detail on it. But for starters, um, let's start with some plain vanilla things like digital toppers. So these ATMs have a digital topper on it. And, you know, we're out looking for people to advertise on that digital screen and we do a couple things we give a percent of that screen to the merchant or to the convenience store owner so that they get benefit out of it which is how it allows us to unseat the competitor so mm -hmm. one of the one of the reasons we're so successful winning these contracts is because of what we're offering which is plus revenue to that location owner so a, a digital topper you know, when we get a large enough amount of them, we're getting to the levels, we're starting to see some traction, we're starting to see our, our first, you know, albeit small, but first levels of incomes coming through on digital toppers on advertising. So as, as we can go out to large national regional brands and as they're looking at, you know, campaigns, a digital topper in New York City, you know, just for, for by way of perspective, a billboard there can be a small billboard can be a million dollars a month. I'm not talking about the big ones hanging in, you know, Times Square. I'm talking about small ones. So you can see the power of advertising. And when you go into these little bodegas, the screens we have them on are pretty uh, substantial and they accentuate well and they really pop. So not only are you catching the person doing the transaction, you're catching people going by and delis will, you know, put coupons or advertise things that they're doing on that digital topper. So that nice. that's one level of it. It's traditional in nature. It's not... It's not, you know, net new technology. Digital screens have been around for a while, but given the demographic and the places we're at, it's very powerful. We've taken the digital topper and we're now integrating it into the transaction screen, which is where you're doing your transaction with the bank. And we're starting to integrate the um, receding so that when you get a receipt, it could give you a dollar off to, say, subways, dollar off to a foot long uh, at subway. Okay. So a lot of interesting things around the digital topper and the actual function of the ATM. The, the mm -hmm. second piece, would be, you know, bank branding. That's kind of built into our model typically, and we know who's going to brand and who's not. But sometimes you go into our portfolio and we bring a bank on later, and if so, we'd, we'd get a percentage of that. But the real game changer becomes proximity marketing, and proximity marketing is a, you know, a broad term that's been out there for a while, and there's many different forms of it as well. But in our case, it would be, you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or geofencing type environments where, for example, the Pennsylvania Turnpike, some of the dis preliminary discussions we've had is when you're two miles from their, you know, travel plazas, their rest areas, they have a blue board on the side of the road. So if we could hit every car that goes by that blue board, you know, we ultimately could, at the geofencing level, we could, you know, throw advertising things out to them. It's more likely when they go in the front door or when they're in a proximity of that ATM that will do it. So proximity marketing is really built around a future model where we can access or get to a user's mobile device, and that's the, the way of the future. There's certainly... We need, to, we need to be able to access that phone. So naturally, if they get on a Bluetooth network or a Wi-Fi, we have them. So if you're going to be in a, you know, whatever, Barnes & Noble's way back when we had done some, some pilots with. So if you're there grabbing a network, it works. But you've got to find a way, and it's best to come in through the cellular network. And there's a lot of privacy and otherwise limitations there that, you know, we're working through. But we think... There's various levels of proximity marketing that within certain demographics or within certain segmentations, we'll be able to get to that mobile phone that's in that individual's hand. And when it gets to them, we'll give them an opt-in or opt-out. And if they opt-in, again, they could get a dollar off a foot long. If they walk into a grocery store, we could direct them to aisle, you know, 12 to you know, to, to get, you know, a dollar off of bananas that day from Dole, whatever it may be, that, that there's just tremendously powerful and creative marketing opportunity. So that is, a, that is our motto is all built based on surcharges for clarity. However, we believe that there's going to be a percent of advertising revenue that will come through and we're cur we currently have that structured in the agreement, and to the extent that we're successful with it, it will give, you know, plus return to the investor who owns the ATM as well. Mm -hmm. So really decisive on the cake is what we're talking about here. 
That's correct. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Well, that, that technology is an amazing thing. You start talking about the geotargeting marketing. I mean, it's just it's um, unbelievable that that even exists, and um, it's just a matter of time. And I know that there's a lot of privacy uh, issues uh, that that are restricting certain types of advertising like that. But it's just a matter of time until. Um, we're not. We're walking into the grocery stores and getting alerts on our phones and coupons sent to us and such. So that's that's powerful. That's very powerful advertising. So I, I want to talk about now, guys. The um, I want to talk about the opportunity. I mean, I think we've peaked. You peaked my interest. I think we've spent enough time on why ATMs. I mean, I think that it just it, it makes sense now that. We talk about the opportunity that exists with you guys. Uh, you know, you've got this this fund put together. Um, there's an opportunity to invest in your fund alongside you guys in this um, this ATM niche. And so, speak to me about that a little bit. Talk to me about the types of investors you're looking for, um, projected returns, uh, lifespan of the investment. Just give me the the general overview of what our listeners could expect should they reach out and have an interest in learning more. Yeah, sure. So, so I'll, I'll I'll jump in on that one. So. Number one, it needs to be an accredited investor. And we, you know, want to get real clear on, you know, if that uh, we want to we want to get real clear with the investor and, and, and have a conversation and make sure that, you know, they, they go in uh, knowing exactly uh, what the investment is, what it does, how it works, and make sure that, you know, our interests are aligned. Mm-hmm. Um if if they um, show interest and want to take it to the next step, we we do have a PPM that we send out that you can read over, um, and then it's just um, from there on. From that point, um, they can sign the docs. Seventy five days later, we we ask for seventy five days from the time we get the payment of one hundred four thousand to the time when we actually have the machine placed and it starts creating revenue. Okay. Uh, that, that's great. That's great, Dave. And I can add a little more color on that as well. The the minimum investment is 104. So actually, let me step back one one step further, and that would be, you know, this fund is called Prestige Fund D. Um, so you would become a, you know, an LLC member. You would get a K1 at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. You would ultimately get a signed K. You would get a signed ATMs that you'd appreciate, even though you're getting the performance of the of the you know the pooled fund. The uh, management company, again, as stated earlier, has looked at the returns, so they're fixing our returns for Portfolio M, which is what we're coming out of here, at $2,155 for every 104K invested. So as I push this forward, the minimums to play or to get in is 104K. You can invest in increments of 104K you know, as you go up, so 208, 312, 416, et cetera. Uh, but the minimum is 104, and then when you get into the return side, or when you get into the deployment side, you know that just to give a little clarity on you know the 60 to up to 75 days is we're purchasing the ATM on behalf of the investor with the management company. You know most of our ATMs are coming from Hyasog, which is a Korean manufacturer, and if you look them up, they're one of the top, if not the top, ATM right now. You know, in the nation, um, you know, Diebold and NCR and others are not as strong as they once were. And, you know, we're essentially, we're ordering it. It's generally, um, you know, coming over from Korea. Sometimes we're getting, you know, our serial numbers as they're in a in a um, container coming across the pond. And they're generally hitting a, a, a port or a warehouse uh, for the management company, sometimes extended LA area, often Houston. And from there, there's all kinds of staging that's done. There, the existing vault is taken out and we're putting a bank vault in, one that's federally approved so that, you know, we meet some of the standards um, out there. We're, we're putting wraps on it. We're inserting technology in it, et cetera. So it goes through a few weeks staging process. From there, it's sent out geographically to where it's being deployed. Could be Chicago, could be New York, could be wherever, Boston. and gets put out there it hits another regional warehouse and from there um you know the contractors pick it up and do the installations but generally that instant in- installation or deployment cycle is 60 to 75 days from investment from that point it's up and running and you're getting your return on it and that return goes from seven years from that point not seven years from when you make the investment so you don't lose that two, two and a half month, it's, you know, the seven year window only starts when, you know, your entire uh, group of, of ATMs are up at, at, you know, the 75 day mark. And what happens at year seven? And you may, you may be, 
And you may be wondering, Kevin, why the odd number, why 104, one out of 100? And, and that's just simply because you're, you're buying seven machines priced at like 14700 a machine or something like that. Gotcha. gotcha. So it's just, just, just how the numbers work out. And it comes to 104, you're actually taking ownership of seven machines. Okay. okay. Yeah, and, and Dave, the, the number on this one's more like the, you know, 15600 The 14800 was another portfolio. The returns were no higher there, as you know. But the uh, that ATM was spec slightly different. It's really spec on how much usage is going through, which drives how many cassettes you need to put in it. You know, if you're in MSA areas, you got to put ten dollar cassettes and twenty dollar cassettes in because you'd be surprised how many people go and pay two fifty and get ten dollars out. As as insane as that may, Isn't that um, unbelievable. Feel to some, it happens. All <laughs> they walk into their favorite convenience store, they get their you know, they get their soda and their cigarettes for the, the next couple of days and they'll take 10 bucks out. So, um, but yeah, th- these ATMs are, I think, 15,600, but they're returning. We have some ATMs that are 17,000, some in that 14,000 range, but they all return almost the same because they're spec according to how many transactions they do. And when you throw them into a pooled fund, that's all blended out. Mm-hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Yep. Okay. And what, what happens at the end of that seven years? Uh, yeah, so at the end of the seven years, I mean, it, it's, you know, essentially it's at that point, uh, you got the ATM, it's a, it's a closed investment. Okay. The ability to take that ATM, we're set up that we'll take that a- ATM and look to get whatever liquidity of it we can. You know, some people would argue that ATMs have shelf life well beyond seven years, and that can be the case. But if you're going to look at this conservatively, which I encourage everyone to do, I would assume it's a seven-year investment. Okay. But there is... Yes, a certain fair market value, hopefully, of that ATM, and we will take all these ATMs and pull them together, and you know, sell them or, or refurb them or put them in a market and get what we can, and essentially close the fund at that point. Okay, and then you'll probably have subsequent funds behind that that will potentially have new ATMs that will go into that space. Yeah, ab- okay, a- okay. A- absolutely, gotcha, absolutely, gotcha. Okay, what questions haven't I asked that uh, our listeners might still have regarding this investment opportunity or just the investment space in general? Well, I just wanted to comment. I think one of the, I think one of the reasons that, um, I mean, there, as Daryl mentioned, there's been an uptick in ATM usage. And I think the reason for that, one of the reasons for that is, you know, when, um, when you hear about the middle class shrinking, that doesn't mean that they're all getting rich. And when you look at the demographic that's using this um, machine primarily, um, that's the fastest growing demographic in the United States. And mm. so there is, I think that correlates somewhat with uh, why there's been an uptick in ATM usage. Yeah, no, I get it. And I, you mentioned the EBT thing. I, I didn't even think of that until you mentioned that, that they went to a debit system, I don't know how many years ago, but uh, gosh, I mean, you, you talk about a, such a large percentage of people in this country that now have debit cards in their hands that need to access this cash. I mean, it's a, it's a perfect demographic for that, you know, for your ATM machines. Exactly. And Kevin, I'll... I'll add a little more color to kind of ATM viability. And I know when I entered this space, I just, I really had to conduct a lot of diligence on why is an ATM going to be viable, you know, seven years out. And that was almost seven years ago now. And here we are, you know, even with higher transactions, but you can make that same argument today. And I'm sure people that look at this are, are asking that, well, there's all kinds of emerging technologies out there. And doesn't that usurp the need of an ATM? So notwithstanding the fact that we can show you that we're seeing upticks across the board, not in every sector, but across the board on ATMs and driven certainly by things like EBT, when, when you look at an ATM and you look at who uses that ATM, and likely a lot of people in this podcast will not be frequent users of ATMs. I was not prior to getting into this space. I certainly use them more today. But when you look at the demographic using it, not is it on, not only is it that, you know, EBT type user, but it is those people that lack credit yeah. and don't have credit cards. It is, it is perpetuated by things like the advent of ACH for payroll. A decade ago, we all got our paycheck by our employer and went to the bank on Friday and took our cash out and put the rest in the bank. Now you don't get a check anymore. It shows up in your account. So 
you're much more apt and people are more apt to using ATMs to pull their cash. So, so that increased it. Ethnic groups, as I noted earlier, it's almost their banking system when you get inside of it. And then you just see, like I said, a lot of these Wall Street banks um, are displacing tellers, closing branches, and they're seeing an ATM as a branch in a box and convenient access to cash on any street corner. Now, not your typical plastic ATM sitting on the street corner qualifies for that, but our ATMs do with the SACE we're putting in. It falls under the federal guidelines um, as deposit cash for banks and you know, that's a, another element. And then, you know, you have this whole millennial thing and some some people argue millennials don't use cash. Other people argue that they're now starting to. But I really use the millennial to say the emerging technologies. I'm a technologist. I was an early adopter of Google Wallet. I use Apple Pay. I use Venmo. Um, I'm using all those things. And when you really get inside those, Kevin, they're predatory to a credit card way more so than ATM and cash. So as a result of Google Wallet, as a result of Apple Pay, as a result of Venmo and things like that, I don't use my credit cards as much. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a big kind of misnomer. And when you start to get your head around it, you can say, yeah, when you look at all the emerging technologies coming out, they're really putting a hurting on credit cards. They're not putting a hurt on cash. And, you know, cash is tangible. The monetary system grows at an international level every year. And in my mind, cash isn't going away. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'll kind of leave that as my concluding thoughts. I will say every investment has risk and, you know, not, there's nothing that can stop some transformative technology from coming out sure. five, six years ago, five, six years from now. But at that point, you know, you have your investment out, have made a great return. And there's nothing at a regulatory or otherwise level that would imply that something's there that's going to usurp the the merit of the viability of an ATM. And if ever, anything, you're seeing the big banks starting to migrate to, towards it and you're seeing the use of an ATM increasing. So the only thing I would end with um, just, just to kind of finalize would be getting a little more specific on the returns. It's for every 104,000 invested, it is, you know, 2155. And when you get inside what that means, that's really a 24% annualized operating, you know, cash on cash return or, or rate of return. However, don't get caught up in the 24% because you're buying an asset, you're depreciating down to zero over five mm -hmm. years. It may or may not be worth anything after seven years. But when you kind of take the effective returns over seven years, putting the 104 up, assuming it's depreciated out over seven years, assuming you get zero, even though you get something for the ATM, the effective returns are more in a 16% range. However, if you start to factor in depreciation, sure. depending on your tax bracket, but even at 25, 30% tax bracket, it'll bring your effective returns up to 16, 17% real quick. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's that's great. Yeah, I, I don't know anyone out there in the world today that's complaining about 15 or 16% returns, Daryl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it, they, they shouldn't. And again, you got the cloud of an ATM through buying a hard asset versus sure. playing in the market where you're buying, you know, paper from a company that's, you know, in some cases fallacy. Daryl, talk talk real quick about the additional collateral of the lease itself. Ah, that's good. That's a good yeah, point. So the, that. The, yeah, the, the collateral would be as follows. Um, number one, it's the ATM. It's a hard asset. They have long usable life. They get good fair market value. So you own that and if there's ever a default by the management company, naturally we take that ATM and we try to sell it or place it with another management company. The second piece of collateral is really interesting and, and quite unique, I would say. and goes back to some of how we had negotiated our original agreements. And that would be if the management company ever defaults on paying us. So for example, if they have a a contract with 20 different little convenience stores in New York City, we have plenty of those, you know, a gentleman or a group of investors that own 20 or 30 stores. If the management company defaults on paying us, we get that lease or we get that location agreement. Mm. Those trade, you can look at the deals being done in this space. They trade for 40, 50, 60 times you know, operating income or monthly GP. So wow. not only do you have the ATM, and, well, there's three elements here. First, you're getting your cash back pretty quick. So your risk goes down every month because it's a monthly payment. Second, you have the ATM. That's a hard asset that has, you know, a pretty good fair market value. And third, if there is a default, we access that location agreement and lease. And you could argue we're in a way better position then because that paper trades for, uh, you know, the aforementioned levels. Um, and it's, you know, having, yeah, having, you know, having the contract, for example, of a Pennsylvania Turnpike, if there was a default on that, 
is of a lot of value and there's a whole lot of management companies across the country that would put big dollars on that and, and mm. get us out pretty fast. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Well, guys, this has been very informative. I really appreciate you coming to the show and I, I want to help those listeners out that, that want to learn more about this, that, that have an interest in, in diving a little deeper and getting in contact with you guys. Um, I'm guessing that the best place to set them as we discussed is the real asset investor.com, uh, Dave, which is your website. You've got more information about this investment opportunity. Uh, is there any other way for them to reach you or should, I, should we just send them directly to the site? Is that the best place? That is a good place to go, and you'll okay. be able to get us there. But I'll also put in my email address or our team's email address. It's info at therealassetinvestor.com, and we'll reply to every email that comes in. We, we always do. And, uh, yeah, f- feel free to reach out to us. I have a slide deck for the presentation that has all kinds of information on it. Uh, i also send out the Excel spreadsheets with the numbers that show you exactly what your return will be. It'll be $2,155 per month for every $104,000 invested. So I have all that stuff, and I'd be happy to send that out to uh, anyone that reaches out to us. Okay, and this offering is open, correct? I mean, you're, you're accepting subscriptions at this point in time. It is open, yes. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Well, Daryl, Dave, this has been an absolute pre- pleasure. I really appreciate you coming on the show and spending time here today. I know that I've, I've learned a ton and our listeners have as well. And so I really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to chatting with you again. So you guys both have a wonderful, wonderful day. Okay. Thank you, Thanks Kevin. Fun, Our Kevin. pleasure. Fun. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com and we'll see you next Monday morning.